switched on. On the purpose. Yeah, Father, we just uh, thank you for Paul. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for the anointing that he carries, Lord. And Father, this morning, Father, we just pray, Father, that uh, he hears from heaven and just brings your word alive, Father. And we just pray for our hearts uh, that, and our ears that will hear from you and apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as I understood it, you had to have one trustee from outside the church, something to do with charity rules. And so I was given that job. I think you tried to sack me once, but Brian, <laughs> Archbishop Brian, said you can't do it. So anyway, <laughs> I feel I'm very honoured to have that to be a trustee of Mount Olive. Uh, a few weeks ago, I tuned in on my computer to Mount Olive and um, and saw the message given by our lovely brother who's now with the Lord Gerald Gotson. I don't know how long ago that was, but he uh, talked about abortion. He said something slightly controversial. He said that Mr. Trump was God's man. And it got me... Um, Excuse me, Paul. Could you just put um, the, um, that in your lower pocket? This. No, you This. Right. Go with your phone now. No, it's um, in my coat. That might be better. Just move your... Down the side. Uh, it's gone off. No, it hasn't. <laughs> Clip it on your pocket. Uh, Is it right there? Yeah, that's that good. sound good? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so I did a bit of investigating. Actually, Mr. Trump only recently has started to insist that Bible study is done in all American schools. He also, of course, um, had the American Embassy moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and has said Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, which he's right on. And he's also quite staunch about sorting out the abortion uh, laws save God. So, in a way, he's, um, let's say, I don't know whether he's God's man, but he's certainly an instrument that God is using. So it will be interesting to see if he gets a second term when it comes up next year. Um, the other thing I noticed about Gerald Godson, I learned something from this. As a, if I'm ever preaching, I'm a bit sort of huddled up in, in, in a pulpit or whatever, but he, he commanded the stage. I've got a, a step-grandson who's going to become a, a, a possibly a premiership goalkeeper. He's only 13, he's 6 foot 1 inch and Exeter City have already signed him so when he leaves school they, because other clubs are interested in him. And one thing he was taught was you've got to come on that gold mouth, your body language, you are the one in charge, you've got to show it, you've got to <coughs> demonstrate it, you've got to move. And so, you know, Europe, this is my area, don't you get in my way. And I noticed that about Gerald Gotson. He gripped this one and it was swaying. And I thought, I don't know who sat, sat in front of me. might find it is that. And he patrolled it. And I, I learned something from that. So what I'm trying to tell you is that for the next um, 50 minutes, hour, this is my domain. <laughs> um, in the 1980s, I don't know if any of you remember him, there was an Irish evangelist called Harry Greenwood. Big jovial man with a healing ministry, played the tambourine with his daughter beautifully. And Harry Greenwood, I always remember, he used to say, if you're thick, praise the Lord. Because it's easier for God to get through. You haven't got a lot of garbage bunging up your brain. So if you're thick, praise it. And I'm never so glad he said that. Because um, one day in 1989, 1990, I was walking down Union Street on my way to church on a Sunday morning. And I was a bit concerned because there was going to be a leaders meeting before the service. And I knew I was going to be asked the question, Paul, what is your vision for this church? 
This was an Elim Pentecostal church, the building next to the museum on the Babacan Road. The Elim had it at that time. And um, I said to the Lord, I, I don't know what to say. How am I going to answer this question? And straight away, Job 29 came at me. I just, as I was walking down, Job 29, immediately I thought, well, what's Job got to do with the church vision? And I sort of rebuked it, and it came back at me. And I thought, wow, sorry, Lord. And I, I knew the Lord was on my case. And so I got to the church and got inside, and, and uh, before the meeting started, opened my Bible at Job 29. And my, my eyes fell on these verses that I want to read to you, and I'll tell you afterwards why I'm reading them to you. This is the church speaking about itself. When the ear heard them, it blessed me. Sorry, when the ear heard, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw, then it approved me. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless, and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. Now, I've had, that was 1990, the Lord gave me that. I've been in various churches. I've never felt prompted to share that. But before I was thinking about today, the Lord kept reminding me. And I believe it's because Mount Olive, you tick all the boxes. There are seven verses, you tick all the boxes. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. When you walk into this place, you can feel the Holy Spirit in the atmosphere, can't you? You're doing the business. I would love to be able to take that out and plonk it on the wall. Because that's why I believe the Lord wanted me to share that. I've shared it with no other church and I've been in a few, but it just I just feel you're doing the business. You're doing the business. Job 29 verses 11 to 17, if you ever want to check yourself out on it. I was, um, I was born at the end of the war, nine months after the end of the war, if that tells you anything. And uh, the Second World War. No. <laughs> Except somebody was about to say which one. <laughs> and, uh, I was born in at that little cottage hospital in Morton Hampstead. You know, as you go out of Morton Hampstead on the road to Whitton Down, little cottage, white cottage hospital. I think it's still functioning. Ch I was a Chagford boy, but Chagford didn't have a hospital. They had, they had a carnival queen, they didn't have a hospital. <laughs> Morton had a hospital, but didn't have a carnival queen. And, um, and um, I should tell you something about Morton Hampstead hospital, an American tourist, an affluent man, had to go to Morton Hampstead Hospital. He was touring Dartmoor and he, he encountered some problem. I'm not sure what it was. So he was taken to Morton Hampstead Hospital and they diagnosed the problem. They wrote a report for him to take back to America. And um, he said, there's just one thing. You do ideally need to take an x-ray with the report. So he said, well, can you guys give me an X-ray? Well, we, we don't have an X-ray machine here in Morton We haven't got one. Um, well, that's no good. What am, what am I supposed to do? So, well, we can get you an X-ray in Morton Hampstead. It's not the hospital, but... And they took him down the road. They took him down the road and into a shop front. And it happened to be the vets, and he, he, was, <laughs> and he was put on this sort of table that animals and you know, farming community, and they have all sorts going in there. He was put on this table the next raid. He went back to America and wrote a scathing article in a magazine about Morton Hampstead Hospital. Anyway, that's, <laughs> 
anyway, I'm, it's going to get serious, Paul, in a minute. Uh, sorry. Um, so, so I was brought up in Chagford, and I was christened in Chagford Church. Then I lived, um, because my father was an army officer, he was posted to Trieste in uh, Italy. So I lived there for about two years, we're talking 1948, 49, that sort of time. Um, I, I nearly became headline news. It's the only time I, I nearly became headline news. My mother told me this about a year and a half before she died. And that I, the border between Italy and Yugoslavia, because um, Trieste was right on that border, that was closed for two hours because I was missing from home. Uh, the son of an army officer was missing from home, so apparently the maid had taken me to some children's party. The maid didn't like my dad, and it's all a long story. So, yeah, so I nearly became sort of headline news in Italy. I, I will get serious in a minute. Um, now then, so I was christened in Chagford Church, and, and this is where I was very fortunate. My parents chose an aunt to be my godmother, and not an immediate aunt, one so down on the family tree, my grandmother's sister's daughter, um, and she was a committed Anglican Christian. And she took those vows at my christening and she stuck to them. She stuck to them for 33 years. She sent me children's Bibles, she's the author of that, just chucked in the loft, no notice taken of them really, or no real. Um, we were taken to Chagford Church every Sunday, when I say we, my younger brother and I, and we would sit behind our grandparents, um, my mother's father, who was a, a, a Chagford farmer, lo lovely fella, lovely fella, and, um, and he would come with his very best clothes on. In the, during the week he was a scruff farmer, he was really scruffy, but Sunday morning, with some brown boots, absolutely polished and shining, and his best tweed suit, best jewelry hat, and he would be in front of us. And um, and around would come the offering bag, and he would put his clenched fist in the top of the bag, and then release it. And of course, my other brother and I were, how much is he putting in? We said to our mum, how much is he putting in that thing? No idea. It's none of your business. It's, you know, it's private. Anyway, she told her dad on the phone, because she was a bit amused by this. Two weeks later, I was helping him unblock a stream in one of his fields, and uh, I said, Gramps, he said, yeah, I said, how do you earn your money? And there was a pause, and then he said, well, he said, you know when we go to church on a Sunday, and my fist goes in the top of that bag, he said, I don't put money in, I take it out, he said. So, <laughs> I thought, I didn't believe it, but the next Sunday in church, you watch it. Anyway, so uh, eventually my father got, my father came back from broad Hong Kong and he got posted to the Midlands, so we had to uproot and go to the Midlands, which was quite a wrench because Chagford was a lovely community to be brought up in. It was very close knit, everybody knew everybody else. Um, so it's quite a wrench. And um, I joined the local choir, a little village church called Hampton on the Hill. So every Sunday morning I would be walking up the aisle of this church with a cassock on and a feeling, feeling very religious, of course, very proud. Um, then uh, my father got posted to Cyprus in 1956 and so we went to live in a little half a farmhouse in the Warwickshire countryside, about a mile from the nearest bus stop, about a mile from the nearest church, but my brother, elder brother and I were in the choir, we had to pump the organ and if you gave your arm a rest, the organ would stop and you'd get into trouble. They paid us 25 shillings for singing in the choir. And I took it home and my mum, she was furious. I was delighted. She was furious. That money's got to go back to the church next week and she was quite strict on things like that. Um, so, um, what, 
Well, what I need to tell you, so you understand uh, how my testimony works out better, uh, my father was a military man, and, um, and my brothers and I were petrified of him. Um, and it remained like that, really, through the rest of because he knew how his thinking went and his judging went. We were petrified of him. So when he was off abroad in the army, it was relief. When he came back on leave, it was on tenderness. It's a bit like you were on, on parade, or on the parade ground as kids. Now, I can't blame him in a way, because I know things about his upbringing. I never remember being put on his knee, cuddled, picked up. I never remember the words, well done, being expressed by him. Um, but then he had an upbringing, and, I, and he never had those things. And his father likewise. I, I got the, so I can easily forgive him. I mean, it's not a problem to me. And, um, and the, whatever hang-ups I had about it, the Lord has dealt with. And, and I'll tell you something a bit later, which was, was rather beautiful that happened to me in a church one morning. Um, 1958, my younger brother and I suddenly found ourselves living in King's Curzel with being brought up by my other grandparents. He was, um, I've been so fortunate, I've had two grandfathers who were totally different, but, but lovely in their own way. And uh, I've been so grateful to both of them. The man in well, in Chaffer, my mother's father, as time's gone on, I've realised he was a, a godly man. He died when I was only ten. And I've missed it. I miss him even now, but I know I'm going to see him again one day. I just know it in there. I will see him again. Um, but my other grandfather brought us up through family circumstances, which I won't go into right now. And... Uh, and we went to school. It had its advantages because he was a top surgeon in his time at Torbay Hospital. He was a head gynaecologist. So he had influence in the town. Uh, he did things, as he later told me, to try and be a good grandfather because he had been a terrible father. He had been so career orientated and, and um, did things like put chicken wire around his best lawn so we could play cricket on it. He'd ring up the Headmaster of Audley Park School, can I, can I have, can pull up tomorrow off, off school because I want to take him to Taunton to see the Australians playing cricket. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so, so the last time I was here speaking was an Ashes summer. That's a, so it must have been about four years ago because this year is an Ashes summer. So yeah, yeah, coincidence. Anyway, um, so. So this grandfather, he did his best. He was really awkward and cantankerous at times, but then he was getting on, and uh, uh, and um, I'm sure he found us uh, hard work. I got involved in the King's Girls all, um, in, down on the playing fields to score for the cricket team, various things like that. We were taken to church each Sunday morning by a grandmother at our mother's insistence, but it didn't mean a thing. I used to daydream through the sermons. It didn't mean anything to me. I thought the people there were just there to keep their social status in the village up. There was a butcher and there was a man that ran the garage and, and so on. And nothing really, um, nothing, it didn't do anything. I found it an absolute drag. As time went on, I didn't have to go there anymore. I got a job in town for four years uh, in, in an office, um, I began to realise that without this job, I had no identity. If this job had been taken away from me, I, I was nothing. I had no identity. I, 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 um, I lived to work. I didn't work to live. I lived to work. Um, and I had my times of depression. Um, there are two Psalms, Psalms 14 and Psalms 53, they both start with the same line. 
the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I did that at 15. I remember doing that. I thought, There's no, there is no God. I'm going my own way now. I remember thinking that. And if I trace it, the 20 years that followed went from bad to worse. Um, I eventually left that office job because I wanted to see the outside world. I had quite a Victorian grandparents. You couldn't do the things quite that the youngsters like to do. So I, thought, I got a taxi driver's job uh, working for Torquay Lapsy Cabs. And um, and uh, I don't want to drag too long on, on my on before the good news. Good news is coming, by the way. Um, and uh, and I uh, call still getting depressed at times. I'm fed up at twenty. One, I had to be put on tranquilizers because I started to feel suicidal. Um, and, um, and at 21, my grandfather told me why we, we went to live with him. Basically, my, my father in Cyprus, booze, gambling, cooking the books to pay for it, got court martialed. Um, I can forgive him because I thought. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Given the same upbringing he had, the same circumstances, I could see me doing the same sort of thing. I could forgive him in a due course of time. Um, and uh, taxi driver was decided to become a self-employed taxi driver with my own car. So I managed to get my own car and joined a firm that offered fares across town for four shillings and sixpence, radio control, pay a commission to the office and so on. So you had a fairly full day's work, did school runs, things like that. And, um, uh, and uh, then the police wanted to see me, the CID, and I got arrested and charged with aiding and abetting an act of forgery. That was because I had to get a loan to get this car and uh, I needed a guarantor. I didn't have anybody I could go to as a guarantor, but a man who I'd helped when he came into town, I found digs for him. He was quite a well spread school teacher or something. He, I can help you, leave it to me, I will get you a guarantor. So he told me, got one and to cut the long story short, he signed the guarantor's signature, but the guarantor hadn't given him any permission, he just happened to be where he was living. So the CID uh, was taking me to court, the solicitor said, give it, give it, it'll be nine months before it gets to the Crown Court, we'll plead not guilty, time it gets there, you could have repaid the, the company you got the money from, and, um, and, uh, and the jury said they might find you not guilty. Anyway, so it went to Exeter Crown Court and uh, I pleaded not guilty. And uh, after an hour or so, the judge said, Well, look, um, call the barrister into his room. I'll give you a conditional discharge if you change your plea to guilty. Because quite obviously, well, I was too proud to say, I'm all oh, right, I'm guilty. No, I'm not guilty. No, I'm not guilty. Barrister I had said, um, yeah, yeah, we, we, can, we can win this case. So, uh, and, uh, so I found myself having lunch down in one of the cells under Exeter Crown Court. It was easy for me to call prison officers sir because of my military upbringing and to thank them for the food. Well, that put me in the good books. They used me as an example with the other prisoners who weren't quite like that. Um, and it was to stand me in good stead a bit later on, because later on, as the day in court ended, it got to a stage where the summing, the summing ups had to take place. Um, no, sorry, the jury had, had yeah, the jury hadn't gone out. But some, anyway, my barrister asked for uh, bail overnight. I'd been on bail for 18 months. I'd got married. I had a, a, a little son. Um, they were refused. So I had to spend the night next to prison. 
which was about the lowest point of my life, suddenly finding myself handcuffed to a prison officer or warden and taken to Exeter prison in a van. And I thought, well, I've never been in trouble before. I thought, what have I done? If it's this, if, that, if I go down for this, I'm turning to crime for the rest of my life. I remember thinking that. Um, and um, so they, what, what helped was, because I was polite to them and called them sir and all the rest of it, they took some trouble over deciding what cell to put me in for the night. They decided to put me in one where the guys in the cell weren't too bad. So uh, they put me in a cell with a lad from St. Austin who fired a shotgun at his mother-in-law's behind. And, um, and another old fella who had no friends, no relations, wanted to spend Christmas inside, so put a brick through an off-license window every time he was let out, so he'd go back inside for Christmas. So it wasn't too bad for me. The old fellow took my box of matches and split each one into four using a pen. He was thought I was wonderful because I had cigarettes with me. And uh, then, then the next morning, a prison officer, do you remember Fulton Mackay in Porridge? Yeah. Yeah. He was just like Fulton Mackay. <laughs> he came to the, open the cell and bend down. Um, Leave the kit back here. You'll be back later for two years, he said. <laughs> so, so this is all quite <coughs> frightening. Anyway, as it happened, the judge, who I had upset quite a bit the previous day by uh, refusing his chance of a conditional discharge, I eventually got found guilty and sentenced to three months imprisonment, suspended for 12 months. So I was able to go back to work. I just had to make sure I behaved myself, didn't pinch any milk bottles, that sort of thing. But the whole thing was quite, uh, I felt terribly, terribly ashamed of myself and wouldn't walk into town, wanted to hide away from people. Uh, anyway, as a result of that experience, I joined the probation service as a volunteer. They were taking on volunteers. I became the first volunteer they took on who had a criminal record. So I felt quite chuffed about that. And I began to help a lady, a probation officer, a spinster, 45, 50 years of age. <coughs> uh, the project I chose, uh, out of several they offered me, I chose the one she was enrolled in because of her personality, because there was something about this lady. She didn't seem to let anything get her down. She seemed to be cheerful happy, there was something about her, and, um, and she was running a boys football team, boys whose dads were in jail, so I went for that, I became uh, 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 one of the helpers running this football team, um, but my first marriage was not going at all well, I sensed that my wife was, uh, there was another man on the scene, there was something, I wasn't sure of it then, but there was something. I became quite depressed. I woke up one morning and I thought to myself, why am I so unstable? Why is it I wake up in a different mood every morning? What is wrong with me? So I went to the doctor and asked to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist started to probe the mental exercises, like, can you remember lying in the pram, your first picture of your dad <laughs> in military uniform, you know, and all this sort of thing. And, um, and of course, psychiatrists, what psychiatrists do, he blames, oh, it's because of your dad, well, because of your dad. Well, yeah, it's a relief to know, but it doesn't solve the problem, and, and, and my dad, what made my dad like my dad, do you know what I mean? So, and I, you know, I'd started going, as this probation officer, I said to her, I'm going around the twist. I've started to pray to God. And she straight away said, well, I pray to Jesus every day. Who are you praying to? And as soon as she said that name, Jesus, it sort of, <coughs> something about that name it was just something about that name as soon as she said it. 
Oh, uh, oh, so that's who I should pray to. And then I said to her, where can I go in this town where I don't have to drink or smoke um, or go in a nightclub or a pub? She said, go across the road, up to Vale Baptist Church. They've got a table tennis team. They've got this, that. They've got groups. And so on a Sunday evening, <coughs> on a Sunday evening, um, as soon as the uh, cricket on telly finished six o'clock, I would press race down the road to up to our Baptist Church. And, um, and I started singing these hymns. Started singing these hymns that Adam, this guy that lived 2,000 years ago. The words didn't make complete sense. But, some of, but, but what struck me was that six, 700 people in the in up to our Baptist Church they all had a peaceful countenance. They all seemed to be that, that contented look on their faces. They were or, or happy. Whereas you went outside and you saw people walking uptown, you could see stress and anxiety. The contrast was, was right God was showing me. And um, so I thought, they, they've got something here. There's, there's something about this place, and I'd walk up the road afterwards each Sunday evening. Because each Sunday evening, I'd race down down the road to get there for the six six thirty start. Um, and each Sunday evening, I'd walk up the road after the service, and I felt happy inside, and I couldn't understand why 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 is it I leave this place and I'm feeling happy. I've been singing about this. Jesus, 2,000 years ago we lived, and, and I'm feeling happy. And my circumstance at the time was terrible. Uh, you know, I was usually downing a gin and tonic to get a night's sleep, but, but when I left this church, I felt happy. And I kept going there for six months. And December 1978, December the 12th, 1978, the minister <coughs> of Upton Vale, Peter Barber, um, he started to preach on Jesus said, I am the way. Not I am the way, the truth and the life, it's just Jesus said, I am the way. And he started to quote the words of a Beatles song of the 60s. You're a nowhere man, going nowhere in this nowhere land. Haven't got a point of view, don't know where you're going to. Isn't that a bit like you and me, he kept saying. And he kept repeating the words of that, and it was just how I was feeling that evening. It was just how I felt. And he said, Jesus is saying, I am the way. It's purposeful, it's progressive, it's rewarding, it's in me. He kept, kept, and, and I left that church in a hurry at the end of the service. I didn't answer the call out, I was just too proud. I wasn't going to walk out in front of all those people. So I got out, and I got out in a hurry. But I walked up that road, and I thought, I've got to turn my life around. I've got to do something about my life. But I felt that Jesus wouldn't be interested in a mess like me. I thought it was too much of a mess. So I thought, right. So I prayed to Jesus a prayer. I laid a fleece. I said, look, if you want me to get baptised, somebody's got to suggest it to me within the next 48 hours, and I, I just left it like that, and, and forgot about it. And the next day I was over at Newton Abbott, mowing my grandfather's lawn. He didn't go to church, his grandfather, but he'd been brought up as a Baptist, and he kicked against it somewhere along the line, probably I think he was first of all trenches, pretty horrific things as a, as a medical practitioner learning his trade and he I think he turned against it somewhere along the line and uh, but as a doctor he had seen it benefited people and the next day as I was telling him about up to Vale Baptist Church um, he suddenly said he says to me my boy so we ought to get baptized <laughs> and I suddenly wow I was, I was on my way home driving the car before I suddenly realised my prayer's been answered. Wow! I was on the new road. And I'm getting this church.
Gerald, Gerald got them. It's, yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway, um, so I went to see the uh, minister, Peter Barber, and, um, and as a result, he uh, did half a dozen baptismal classes. And, um, and uh, I got baptised. I remember kneeling before a little two bar electric fire on a very cold morning. I had a sort of flat in Woodfield Road, a rough flat, and asking Jesus into my life, saying, Look, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I've been. I'm sorry what I've done, I'm sorry for this, that, and the other, and, and, um, and please come in, please come into my life and, and sort me out. And I felt a terrific peace for the rest of that day walking in town. I went to drop a bit of litter on Mars Bar, dropped the litter on the pavement, regular habit, oh, and as soon as I dropped it, I, I, it was like, oh, and, and uh, Never, never did it again. It always went in the pocket. Always, that's the first time I was sort of convicted after, after praying the sinner's prayer. Um, so, uh, and I was going to get up to rail now in the mornings and in the evenings. And, um, and I'd become a Sunday school teacher because my son wouldn't go down to Sunday school. He wanted to stay with me right through the service. So they thought, best way to get into Sunday school, Paul, you become a Sunday school teacher, you work fine, works good. So my son and daughter were coming down to Sunday school because uh, they'd stay the weekend with me. I was divorced by this time. Um, but three months, so we say three months further on, and, and I found I was still drinking, swearing, and smoking. Not to any great extent. Um, certainly not drinking much, because I had seen what it did to my grandfather and my father and the mood swings, and that, it tended to put me off booze. But, but still, I was still. Um, Drinking, swearing, and smoking. I was one thing on a Sunday and another on a Monday. I was leading a double life. And I was good behaviour on a Sunday and back at work on a Monday with your workmates. And suddenly find myself talking their kind of language. And I started to say, Why haven't I changed? I started to say to God, Why? Haven't I changed? Everybody's told me that I I would change that and, and the word says it and <coughs> why isn't it happening to me? Why am I still like this? And I started to get drawn towards these people that were in Upton Vale, they had beards, they were wearing scruffy jeans, t shirts. They had long hair, they were like the throwback from the hippie, you know, the 1960s hippie people. And, uh, and they, there was a sort of group of them. And I sort of explored the various groups in the church uh, and didn't feel comfortable with any of them particularly. And I, the last group I wanted to get involved in was this lot. And yet I found that their problems were common to my problems, that we hit common ground when we were talking and they, they had a problem giving up smoking, they, and uh, they weren't such a bad lot after all. They had, I love Jesus on t-shirts, well I wasn't that sort of bold at that time. You know? <laughs> anyway, I got involved in a, a Sunday evening sort of spiritual jamboree they, that this, <laughs> this group held down at the a big house down in Old Mill Road, which was totally sort of um, alien to, nothing to do with Upton Vale Baptist Church, but I think Upton Vale knew it was going on. And, um, and I was still saying to God, look, I, I need to change, I need to change, why haven't I changed? And, and uh, I got interested in a full gospel, this is men's 
breakfast that was taking place at the Grand Hotel. And I, I'd heard that it was coming up and um, I thought, how do I get to that? And I mentioned it to these, these people and one of them, I knew this ticket was meant for someone. So, so I suddenly had a ticket for this breakfast at the Grand Hotel. And, um, and along I went to the Grand Hotel and good breakfast and they had a guest speaker and the guest speaker was a man, he was a businessman who'd come to know the Lord Jesus when he was in prison. He'd been jailed for fraud. Um, but the more he spoke, the more I thought I could, I could talk to this man. I, could, uh, I want him to pray for me. There's a whole mass of people here and, and he, there was a call out at the end and uh, I wasn't going to go out in front of all these people. And I just, I said, Lord, if you want me out there, you've got to cause me to take, to make the first step forward. And I suddenly had, I'd taken a step forward, so I had to go the rest of the way then, else I'd look a bit foolish. Um, so I went up to this man and joined, I went, joined the queue and then got to him and he said, what's the matter? And I told him exactly what I told you, look, that I still do this, that and the other. I haven't changed. Why? And he put his hand on my head and started praying. And he started praying in tongues. And he said to me, um, let, let your tongue go. Let, let your tongue go. Well, I'd heard these people speaking in tongues. I thought they were weird. <laughs> and, um, Anyway, he said, go on, let your tongue go. And I just made up, I just went, blah, blah, blah. You, you've got it, you've got it, you've got it, he said. Now go home and practice it. Well, <laughs> so, I, you know, I left that meeting, I was on cloud nine. I, particularly because of what he'd said about the tongue, but I felt such a peace and such a joy. And I was... And, and this peace and this joy, it stayed with me for, for days on end. I would get home from work and I would put on the one cassette tape I had, which was Small Corners, Cliff Richard. But there was one song that he would kept singing and every time it came up, I was praying to God, I was crying my eyes out, I was confessing the way I felt about my parents, the way I, all this dirt kept pouring out. <coughs> and um, yeah, I've got the words to this song, I've got them off. Why me, Lord, what have I ever done to deserve each, even one of the pleasures I have known? Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you or the kindness you showed? Lord, help me, Jesus. I've wasted it, so help, Jesus. I know what I am. Now that I know that I needed you, so help me, Jesus. My soul's in your hands. And, and try me, Lord, if you think there's a way I could try to repay all I've taken from you. Maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself on my way home to you. I was crying my eyes out night after night just listening to this tape and confessing how I felt about certain people. I did grow up with a terrible fear of authority, school teachers, bosses at work, mainly because I was <coughs> frightened of my dad, if you know what I mean. So, so um, but the gift of tongues I didn't use much to start with, but I did practice it. And I have to say, two things come to mind. My wife, one day, was in the kitchen and, and she'd had problems with a slip disc in her past. And suddenly she was in agony with this back. She could hardly move from the pain. And I didn't know what to do. I felt absolutely, what can I do? <coughs> and I just put my hand on her back and started praying in tongues. And within half a minute, she suddenly, it's gone, it's gone, I'm fine, fine. Yeah. The other time, I was in 
Torquay United's football ground with my eldest son. He got the ticket, he was back from university, it's a chance to meet him, have a chat. So we went to the football match together, we were sat in the family stand. And four o'clock came, second half, four o'clock came, and the wind from the Baba Command, and I was feeling, I was absolutely frozen. It was really biting into me, I've never felt so cold. I thought, what do I do? I don't want to walk out on him. He bought me here, he paid for the ticket, he bought me a basket, I have time, I don't want And I started playing in tongues. And you know, we, and then the game sort of took over my focus, but five, ten minutes later, I felt a warm glow right down the centre, like a heater inside, going out. Um, those are two things, there's times, emergencies, and other situations where I've not known quite what to play, where I found the gift of tongues. And people have said, oh, it's a list of the spiritual gifts. There's no way in the Bible where it says that, actually, that it's the list of the gifts. Um, what's it sound like? Well, at first it sounded like a, a lot of gibberish. It really does. It doesn't make sense. But mind good. That's an example of it. I don't know what I've said. I don't. But that's the kind of. And it varies. It tends to vary um, as time goes on. What I want to say is, um, I was told I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit when that man put his head on. And, and I got the gift of tongues. And I wondered about that, but the definition of uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit is a second work of grace that empowers a person for Christian life and service. And I can honestly say from that day on, those habits started to fade away. And, um, and from that day on, I felt I was being empowered for Christian life and service. I've had hiccups along the way. I haven't been perfect. I've um, once or twice stepped outside of God's will, I'm sure. But I know that was the start of the, what's the word, regeneration <coughs> work in me, if you get correct. Fear of authority. <coughs> Has gone. I can tell you now, one of the biggest problems I had in the 19, when I was a, a volunteer worker of the probation office, was attending their meetings. And we'd be sat in the room. I couldn't speak. When it came to my head, I felt so self conscious, so inferior, I think is the word, intellectuals were around me, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't speak in a group of people. I would avoid, avoid things like that. So for me, to be stood in front of you and able to speak freely is, is a miracle. And, and at 40 years of age, I could have done it. So it's, it's all happened in the last 30 years. God has been so good to me. I now find myself as a lay preacher having to go to various churches and run services from start to finish. They're not like the beautiful worship you have here. I, I really love that. They're the old hymn books, but and some of the old hymns. I can't say that's, but I know that's what I'm meant to be doing for the moment. I know that's what God's called me to do. He's a miracle working God. He's a miracle working God. But I think the reason I had to say what I've said today started with that baptism in the Holy Spirit and that gift of tongues, and that set me going. Thank you for listening so intently. Thank you for allowing me to. I heard one like this before, it's good. Thank you anyway. Thank you very much for having me. Here last week, um, 
David um, taught um, about the gift of tongues. And Paul didn't know. We haven't told him. So, you know, I believe that the Lord is really kind of saying to us today as a people, if you're not, if you don't speak in tongues, I believe it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like prayer, um, we're going to have time for prayer. We're going to have lunch. And for those um, that don't want prayer, then, you know, get involved. We're getting everything ready. But for those who want to um, be prayed for, um, it's available. We don't want to hold back the Holy Spirit. And there was a reason, always a reason why. Um, you know, you might have wondered where Paul was going at the, the beginning. But you know that the Lord has... Uh, we've all had journeys. We've all had difficulties. And thank you, Paul, for your ministry. And thank you for the truth of your past. You know, because we do have struggles. <coughs> But the Lord knows as well. And you know that we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And part of the gift of that is to speak in tongues. I speak in tongues. And the amount of times I've said to the Lord when I'm praying for something, I've got no idea, Lord, what to pray for. And suddenly I start speaking in tongues. I have the interpretation of what's wrong with the person. And where are the Lord? And they're here. And so... It's not something to think, oh well, <clears throat> I'll just push it to one side. And we all need to get to tongues. Bless you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to close in prayer now. <clears throat> yeah, Father, we just thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you that we have entered into the inner throne, Father, in worship and prayer, Father. And Father, we just thank you for uh, a calling us to be here this morning. Father, as I uh, look from here, Father, there's many faces and different faces and different ages. And Father, that we've had different journeys. But Father, that you want us, Father, each and every one of us, to have that encounter of you. Encounter of your Holy Spirit. An encounter of Jesus. And so, Father, I just pray, Father, that as your Holy Spirit comes on this meeting, Father, and speaks to people. There's more. There's more, and there's more. And Father, I just know you don't want us just to stay where we are. Because you brought us here today to move us on. And so, Father, I just thank you, Father, for each and every one that has taken part. Thank you for the tears. Thank you for the ministry, thank you for the worship and praise. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So we're going to have lunch. Um, for those who uh, don't want prayer, if you'd like to move your chairs to one side and bring out the uh, tables and uh, go and help Angela um, to bring over the food and set the tables. We're all